Tonight, we're focusing on some calculations. Yeah. Um, we are going to be doing a lot of these when you look at assignment number one. Okay. If you've started looking at assignment one, you will see the ratios are a big focal point in the first assignment. And even when looking at past papers, you'll see ratios also form a large portion of the actual exam. So yeah. tonight's um, content is actually really important from a preparation point of view because you do need to try to be as familiar as you can with these actual equations and some are quite easy to remember some are a bit more challenging yeah all right so to start off the first bit is just the learning outcomes for study unit two we're looking at financial statements and we're looking at the analysis okay so we're, we're doing more than just drawing up the statements because you've already done the accounting module which was the 1601 in 1601, we focus on the actual preparation of those financial statements. In FIN, in finance, we're using the information that's contained in the statements to do this, the analysis, and to try and make some sort of decision. We do a bit of it in this module, but majority of it gets done later on. Okay, so um, in FIN 3701, in FIN 3702, those are two other modules that use the same textbook. Um, obviously, you cover the rest of the chapters that you haven't looked at in this module in those modules. So everything sort of comes together at a later stage if, if those are modules that are part of your um, specific degree. Different students do different courses. Um, it all depends on your, uh, your major and your, and your choice of subjects. All right. Yeah. So tonight, we've got a lot of ratios, and we're looking at this, the relationship between debt and equity, okay, so financial leverage. This is important because it relates to your funding or your financing. So when looking at financing, companies have a choice. They can either use debt or they can use equity when financing new projects or investments. And depending on their preference, certain companies may be more aggressive and then they'll go along the lines of debt okay, in terms of loans. Others yeah. are more conservative and they'll then use more equity rather than debt. And we'll discuss reasons why later in terms of why would you rather choose the one over the other when, when um, financing a particular business. Companies yeah. always need to prepare reports and they need to show the, cons um, not the consumer, the users, what the actual current condition is in the actual entity. So something like profitability is key for shareholders because shareholders want to know if they're making a profit or not. Sometimes they also want information about the market value. So what is the value of the actual equity that we have in the business? Or what is the value of the debt? So we're looking at value and we look at profitability and we're trying to make a decision on how well the company is performing. So we're going to look at obviously a summary of the different ratios. There are quite a few ratios that you need to be um, familiar with in terms of the calculations. Um, and obviously with more practice there, they get a bit easier to remember and, and use as well. And then an important yeah. point here is DuPont. DuPont is very, very popular, and not only in this module, but in other modules as well. And we'll look, we'll look at why. Um, just to give a quick, maybe, note about DuPont, it's looking at return on equity. Okay, we'll explain the complexities of the actual system of analysis later, but for now, we're just focusing on, well, DuPont is one means, okay, it's, it's a means of getting more information um, to then make a better decision. Okay. Decision making is key, and that's why we've got this link with accounting and finance. Okay, remember, uh, last week we spoke about the relationship that economics has on financial management in terms of finance, and we also spoke about the relationship that accounting has in relation to finance. So yeah. both economics and accounting link up with this particular subject, because we're looking at the decision making and decision making requires information. And that's the okay. focus in this particular module. It's all about the information. So I wanna start off by asking you about the shareholders report. Okay, did you manage to source um, an example set of financial statements? I did and I left it on my desk at the, at the factory. All right, okay, don't stress. That's I was having a look at it this afternoon. Okay, it's it's alright. We've got we've got other examples to to look at, so that's not uh, it's not not a train smash. Uh, but uh, just 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 to um, ask you the relevance. So, for example, 
You've obviously sourced a set of financial statements in terms of the shareholders report, or sometimes they refer to it as the annual report. Yes. How, how is that relevant and, and is it important? Uh, well, it's very important. And Why? it's relevant because it, it lets the shareholders know what's essentially happening in the company. Okay, good. All right. So in terms of activity, okay, what's actually happening, that's, that's a great answer because shareholders want to know what's happening. How often does this report come out? Uh, it's usually uh, twice a year, isn't it? Yeah, you normally get um, six months. You, you normally get interim reports and then yeah. you get the final report. So yeah. as you said, normally twice a year because companies prepare the interim report um, and then that gives a good snapshot of things currently. Because remember, users don't only want to see this report once a year because that's 12 months to wait till the next, uh, let's mm. say, source of information. So a lot trying can change. To, yeah, a lot can change, you're right. Um, trying to get information more timelessly would be better than waiting too long. So ideally, shareholders would want to report how often? Once a month. Definitely, they would want it even maybe daily perhaps if, they, if it was possible. Yeah. So yeah. even daily or monthly, that would be a really good it's a source of information for them to make a decision. Okay, in terms yeah. of the relevance, how is it relevant? So we know it's, it's very important. We, we've established that. But how, how relevant is it? Um, it's very relevant because it's, it's making you understand whether your investment is safe, whether you should get in a bit more or get rid of it. Or Okay, and in terms of the report, what does the report give you? What information? Is it... Is it based on, on what has happened or what is going to happen? Uh, it's based on what has happened, but doesn't, don't they also give you an idea of what their plans are for the future? Yes, they do. Okay, correct. Okay, so the focus is generally on what has happened, so it's historical. But yes, the figures. So, for example, all of the financial statements that are prepared in the actual report would be based on historical figures and data. But as you said, they are going to be giving an indication of what the future expectations are going to be. There's normally a section in the report uh, where they cover plans going forward and, and what investors yeah. could expect um, to happen or, or to see happen in the actual um, accounting records. Right, so here we've got a definition for an annual report that a publicly owned company must provide. Why do publicly owned companies need to provide these reports? Uh, isn't it for, it's, it's a requirement. If they on the JSC, they have to make it public. Okay, very good. Okay, so last week we spoke about the different markets. Do you remember which markets we get? Um, what do you mean markets? There were two types of markets, primary and secondary. So you've given me JSC as an example. Which market is the JSC? That was primary and, and secondary. It's depending. both, but we need to specify when is the JSC primary? When it's uh, when it's the IPO, when they have the IPOs. Correct, good. It's okay, so secondary when they trade the shares afterwards. Exactly, well done. All right, so that's perfect. So IPO, when we first list, we list on the exchange. And if you describe the exchange, how is an exchange different to buying shares over the counter? Uh, so we spoke about an exchange versus over the counter. So the OTC market and the exchange traded market, what was the difference? So how is the JSC different to OTC over the counter? Um, wasn't the JSC a lot more regulated and over the counter it's a bit more, uh, how do you put it? It's like, open like you can not really you can do what you want sort of perfect well done okay so definitely the JSC is regulated and that's why we need to look at public companies okay because public companies have responsibility to society um, they can allow or they're actually getting capital from anyone okay, from people across the world in terms of capital and we know from different forms of ownership all companies want to eventually list at some point in time because that gives them access to more resources, to more yeah. capital. And we said last week that resources were limited. 
So companies need resources if they need to grow, if they need to um, develop and, and improve as a business. Yeah. Okay, so um, just a question then in terms of, so you, you're you running a business uh, as part of the, the, the family business. So uh, how do you approach financing? Are you seeking external finance or is it primarily finance internally? Would, would you ever consider listing at some stage in the future? Um, not really. We, we're not big enough to do that. And all of the stuff that we do buy, we finance ourselves. Okay, all right. So you're not, you're not looking at loans or you're not looking at debt to finance those assets. When you say finance yourself, you're looking at equity, hey? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we generally, if we do borrow, we borrow very little. All we, right, we, so, so how would you describe the company then in terms of its philosophy or its, its focus? Would you, would you say it's a very aggressive company or very conservative? Uh, very, on what you've very said? risk averse. Yeah, okay, so more risk adverse. And, and why, why is that though? Um, I don't know, it's just that so my grandfather started working like that and my dad sort of took it over and adopted the same mentality and now I've got the, the same sort of thing. I'd rather wait a bit longer and get a machine that if in six months time we lose the contract, we have enough capital to say, right, well, we'll just pay off the machine and it's ours rather than have yeah. it repossessed. All right. Okay. Fascinating. So, so it's it's basically been um, part of the internal, let's say, structure. So, so as you said, your granddad had started the company, and then obviously had passed on um, the let's say the culture um, from generation to generation. So, um, you're you're currently sitting with um, obviously history because what has happened in the past is re- uh, is replicated almost. In, in, in what's happening today. Yeah. Okay, so if we're looking at a more conservative approach, those documents and those summaries, okay, we're going to be looking at them for, in terms of information, so details. So the details are key. Um, so obviously you guys are running a private company. Um, do you still yeah. audit your financials though? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. And what are the, what's the reason for an audit? Why do company? Why do some companies have to be audited? Well, like the the public companies, it's it's a legal requirement. Correct. And for for us, it's more a case of just having the information there, so that if we do need to borrow money, we can give the the banks the papers. Yes. And also, so that we know what's going on, because as as good as our management accounts might be we might slip up at some point. Yeah, all right, so very good. Okay, so definitely peace of mind is what the auditors give us in terms of that confirmation. So we know that if the auditor says things are okay and things are as what they appear to be, then we can we can then say, well, all right, everything's running successfully and we don't need to worry about anything currently. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so when looking at all of these requirements. So you, you touched on quite a few of them. You spoke about JSC rules, okay, so things that are mandatory that they have to do. Right, then we also have things like generally accepted accounting practice and we have bodies, okay, regulatory bodies like the accounting practices board. So when looking at these three different, um, let's say areas, okay, in terms of um, preparing the financial statements, are they relevant and important? Um. <laughs> Depends to which company, like the JC policies and requirements don't really mean anything to a company like my dad's because it's, we're not listed. Correct. But the, the generally accepted accounting practices, that's, it's relevant to us because we Correct. do use that. Okay, good. Okay, so um, do you agree that in terms of the financial statements, um, having all of these rules in place give us a basis so we can compare one company with another? So. Even though you're running a private company, you could maybe consider looking at the financial reports of a public company. So if you knew of a similar company, um, they might be a bit bigger, uh, or you could look at maybe smaller companies on the the Alt-X board, and and, and that gives you an indication of your competitors as well. So when looking at the company, um, it, it gives a way to compare like for like almost, or to help with the actual, let's say, structure of the business. So um, if 
if listing on the exchange is a goal that you and your family would like to consider maybe in the next few years, then that yeah. might be a good idea to maybe look at the actual reports. So yeah. um, what sort of industry would you classify your, uh, is it more mining would you say, or is it more like um, equipment based or um, which sort of industry would you say you guys fall under? We work a lot for the, the steel mills. So, steel, all right. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, would you say manufacturing more than mining yes. or mining more than manufacturing? No. no, manufacturing. Manufacturing. Okay, so if manufacturing is the core business, then you could maybe look at one of the maybe smaller companies or even larger companies um, to get information about how are they financing operations because maybe, maybe increasing the amount of debt may help the business grow as well because yeah, while we're discussing this so you guys are using equity okay to finance the purchase of assets okay yeah. what do you pay on equity uh, what do you mean what do you pay on What's equity the cost of equity um, it's your profit so you, yes. you lose the profits correct yeah profits dividends okay so and um, that's something that you would have to pay or, or let's say raise in terms of equity. Okay, so if you're using equity, so for example, your family, you as, as, as part of the, let's say manage, management of the actual business, you guys are going to be giving capital to the business to buy certain assets. So if you're doing that, surely there has to be some sort of compensation for that risk. Or not? Uh, yeah. Not really, because we structure it in a way that it doesn't come out of essentially our equity. It comes out of the retained earnings. No, 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 no. We, profit. we sort we create an expense. Yeah. And that gets put away on a monthly basis. And then when we get to our target amount, then we go through with it. So okay. we carry on with, with our sort of equity yeah. that gets given to us. And then the, the financing gets expensed. Okay, nice. Okay, so the reserve, so it sounds like you're actually allocating um, funds aside from the day-to-day -day running of the business yes. for specific purposes. Yeah, so that would be treated as equity. Okay, so that's great. So in that, in that point, well, from that point of view, um, do you pay tax on that equity that you guys are, are keeping or, or setting aside? Uh, yes, we pay company tax on it, I think. Yes, okay, so now, if you think about it, you're actually financing the asset with after-tax profits, where you yeah. could actually finance the asset with before-tax profit, because if you're looking at debt, what's, what, what's the benefit of taking out a loan for buying those assets that you guys are using as part of your day-to-day -day running? Well, you keep the equity in your company, first of all. And, and what, then, what can you do with this, the interest? you can um deduct it exactly i think okay it's yeah. deductible so yeah. if you're if you're taking out equity in, ter in terms of you're taking from the profit of the business to save it for a particular asset that's fine that's more conservative but the other side of it would be looking at the amount of debt okay so how much debt are we going to raise because raising more debt is going to give us more of a deductible, we can deduct all the interest on that particular yeah. asset. Yeah. Okay. Something else that we looked at last week was tax, and we mentioned depreciation is also a consideration, right? Yeah. Okay, so do you guys often buy new equipment that you guys are utilizing in the business? So like, um, how often do you upgrade the computers? Uh, computers are upgraded about every two years. Why and we... do you do that? because the the programs that we run require the latest computers okay all right good so it's it's because of operations but it's probably also because um after two or after three years you've actually written off those assets and there is no yeah. more wear and tear allowance you can claim yeah and then you replace them and you get that allowance back exactly or not back but you but can indirectly. start again yeah so is the company classified as a company or is it classified as a SBC, a small business corporation or a micro business? What sort of, um, what classification does it fall under? Is it just normal company? Yeah, we are PTY limited. Okay, so normal PTY limited, but not, yeah. not under the umbrella of a small business corporation or anything like that? Uh, okay, no. So you don't have accelerated write-offs? No. Okay, all right. So yeah, that's interesting. So when looking at this, 
do you agree the relevance and importance of all of these requirements is a way to keep the information standard it's to standardize all of the information so even though you're a private company or a public company it, it, it's, it doesn't make a difference we're still using the same set of rules yeah. okay to keep it standard all right, so what are the four different statements? You've seen them before in accounts. Okay, we should have a pretty good idea of what each of these statements cover in terms of their elements. So when yeah. looking at IAS1, um, the relevance and importance here is just disclosure. Okay, you've yeah. obviously looked at drawing up these statements um, previously in a, in a separate module. So when looking at disclosure, there are four statements that we can prepare that will tell us something about the business. So what yeah. do each of these statements tell us about the business in terms of the main elements? So what are the main accounting elements that are covered in each of the four? Uh, well, comprehensive income, that's income and expenses. Yes. Uh, financial position, that's assets and liabilities. Yes. And changes in equity is equity. Correct, which is the capital and the drawings, yeah, and different forms uh, of equity, good. And then statements of cash flows, that's actually looking at your physical cash flow. Yeah, inflow and outflow, perfect. All right, so definitely, from a decision-making point of view, we need all four, right? Yeah. Okay, because all four tell us something different about the business. So if I'm only looking at profitability, is it possible to increase profit without doing anything in the business? Uh... Not really. Like you might get lucky and it might happen, but not necessarily. It shouldn't work like that. Okay. So, what what's the best way to increase profit? So, let's say increase. tomorrow you could do something tomorrow that would would that would immediately increase your profit without having to buy new equipment or anything like that. What reduce what, expenses? It, uh, well, okay. Decrease expenses. Uh, that that could be an option in terms of cost cutting. But uh, what about debtors or credit sales? Yeah, you can call in your debtors. Okay, so what happens? Do you guys have debtors? Yeah. Okay, so you do sell on credit? Uh, yes, we do. You probably screen your debtors before giving them um, credit, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, so with that, let's say you, um, you change the credit policy and you make it easy for anyone to buy on credit from your business what is that going to do to the bottom line the profit it, it inflates it correct it's going to shoot up right because now you're going to be getting several suppliers buying maybe more from your business because you've made debtors more accessible to them yeah okay but what is that going to do to your cash flow uh, it's going to reduce your cash flow because you Definitely. you're not going to be getting that money in for a while correct yes okay you're, you're tying that you're tying that, well, basically you're financing someone else's purchase, so you're sitting with that shortfall in terms of cash. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so when looking at that, you need to be looking at all the different forms of statements because the statements uncover something different about all the businesses. And we'll, and we'll discuss some of the examples later when we look at it. Okay, so for now, I just want you to think generally uh, in terms of different accounts. So. Um, can you think of some assets offhand? Your assets are your uh, PPE, all that sort of stuff. Your debtors, your your bank. Anthony? Yes, I'm here. I'm listening. Uh, okay, all right. So it went it went blank over there. My screen went all fuzzy for all. Oh, okay. No, I'm listening. You said PPE. You said debtors. You said bank. Bank. Uh, what else is there? There's your uh, inventory, right? That's a big one. It's not inventory. Inventory is your an asset. Um, cash? No, that's yeah. Cash is an asset. Yeah, cash is definitely an asset, part of the bank. Okay, so do you agree? Assets are going to be grouped in long-term and short-term categories, right? Yeah. Okay, so is that an important differentiation to make? Yes. Okay, good. So when looking at that, so you've mentioned a few. If we look at the non-current assets versus the current assets, when we look yeah. at financial management, how are we going to finance the purchase of those assets? Uh, with 
with so give me an example of a non-current asset that would be your buildings okay PPE all right property all right so let's go with that one so tell me how you would finance that generally with debt what sort of debt a loan okay long term or short term long term good okay so long term debt would be applicable here because we've got a long term asset yeah okay current assets are financed with short term yeah okay so think about inventory are you going to use the bond to buy inventory no, no. you're going to use your cash exactly yes you'll use your cash or you'll use creditors yeah you'll use a short term liability so the point I'm trying to make here is when looking at that for financing, we're going to be looking at long-term debt with long-term assets, short-term debt with short-term assets, because those assets have a useful life. And if we we're going to be using those assets for a longer period of time, those assets would hopefully actually finance themselves. Because if you're buying a new building, that building should be generating inflow. Income. Income, yeah. yes. Either in the form of production or maybe rent rent yeah and that would then finance the actual purchase of that asset yeah okay so liabilities why are they important can you think of a few your loans or liabilities your creditors uh, mm, bank overdraft maybe yeah overdraft yeah revolving credit those types of things hey yeah all right perfect okay good and then we've got income and expenses right those are maybe easier to to list because they're operational okay so yeah. income and expenses are what what we're actually going to deal with from a day-to-day -day type of um or more so on a day-to-day -day type of um uh, let's say uh, as part of the day-to-day -day, rather than as part of let's say assets liabilities we're not going to be buying assets every day okay we could no. maybe in terms of inventory depending on what we're selling but generally yeah. income Check expenses income. is what we see day to day. Yeah. So some examples? Income sales, uh, payments from your creditors, uh, expenses would be your, like you said, day to day running. Just general stuff that you'd buy, office supplies. Yes. Your, your expenses like your electricity and lights, telephones. Yes. Okay, good. That sort of stuff. All right, yeah, good. So all of those are operational. So when looking at the statements, we need to pull out the key information that we've got. Okay, so I'm gonna use the example statements that I've got to, to maybe discuss some of these points. Okay, so let's first talk about this generally. Okay, so statement of comprehensive income, main focus, information that we're gonna take away here is on what? Uh, your income and your expenses. Correct, which we know calculates the profit. That's yeah, net, okay, net yes. and That's it. Okay, so we've got that as a focus. All right, so let's talk about uh, the example that I've used is I've tried to keep it more, um, let's say, modern okay, in terms of um, things that we see or use perhaps um, on a day uh, by day basis. Okay, so the example that I want to show you is looking at social media. So Facebook and Twitter. Okay, those two. All right, okay. so are you familiar with the two? yeah do you use both uh facebook sometimes twitter not really okay so if we're looking at these two companies right from a profitability point of view so from a statement of comprehensive income point of view what yeah. sort of income okay and expense do you think they have so if we're looking at their profit right what sort of how how do you think that or, or yeah let me ask you this what what sort of profit do you think they're making in terms of the the annual um, bottom line? Um, what do you mean? What sort of profit? So, like, how much do you think they're making as a profit? How profitable uh, are these companies? Millions. Millions. They, so if we had they, to they, guess, they mess. give me a give me an estimate for Facebook. Uh, Facebook. What was it? I think I heard. Wasn't it in the billions, like two billion or something like that? Okay, yeah, that let's put that down. Valuation. Okay, that's a good estimate. And uh, how about how about the other company, the competitor, Twitter? Uh, Twitter, I'd be having a proper guess at that, and half or 
three quarters of it. Half or three quarters. So what should we say? An amount? One billion. A billion. It's, okay, fine. Yeah, it's just a pure guess. Yeah, no, that's fine. All right. So looking at those two, okay, do you agree profitability is a measure of what? Of how well they balance their incomes and expenses. Okay, and that's an accrual, and that's based on what? The, the accounting rules, right? Yeah. Okay, so the accounting rules are going to help create a statement of comprehensive income which is going to show profitability, okay, in the form of income minus expenses. Okay, so if we then compare these two companies, let's have a look at. Facebook. Okay, let's start with that one. That was the first one that we mentioned. Okay, okay. Um, let's go to the statement and let's make that a bit bigger. Okay, so can you see that on your side? Yeah, I can right. see it perfectly. Great. So looking at the statements here of Facebook, and remember we said that Facebook is regulated, right? So if you look at the top bit, you'll see this is an exchange, right? The Securities and Exchange Commission, that's the regulator that regulates the buying and selling of Facebook on an exchange, okay, being yeah. the NASDAQ, okay, right, the New York Stock Exchange, that's what we're looking at there in terms of the listing, okay, so maybe just okay. to bring some theory into it, is this a public or private company? Public. Correct. Public company because the information is publicly available and they're traded on an exchange, so there's regulation, there's, there's oversight. Um, and they need to prepare statements that have been audited, right? Yeah. Great. So let's go back to the statement of income. Obviously, the Americans call these slightly different. Okay, so we call it the comprehensive income. They use the American generally accepted accounting practice. If we look at these years, so we've got five years here, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Yeah. What would you say? How, how would you describe the performance in terms of profitability uh, that this company has? It's increased. Good. It's grown. It has, eh? You're probably looking at that line item. Yeah. Okay, so how much is the actual net income or net profit? Uh, they don't show net profits on here, do they? No. They do? Net income? Oh, net income, sorry, yeah. So that's what's it? Three point six million. No. No. Three point six billion. Yes. Okay. So you had a very really good guess. Okay. You were very close. Okay. I mean, two billion. That was close. The actual amount is three point six. Yeah. Three point yeah. six. Yeah. And that's how much they're making as a profit. Do you agree? Okay. Yeah. So good or bad for the company? I'd say that's pretty good. Okay. That's really good. So. In terms of profitability, is Facebook making a profit? Yes. Yes. So from an accounting point of view, in terms of the accruals, remember accruals is looking at when do you earn okay, income and when do you yeah. incur expenses. So they're yeah. earning a lot more income than they are incurring expenses. Yeah. Great. Okay. So do you think Twitter's doing better or worse than them? Um, I think Twitter was doing all right, but didn't they have a bit of a downturn? Okay, so let's have a look. All right, so you you definitely said less than Facebook, okay? So yeah. let's see how much is it actually. Okay, so let's go to the same statement and let's have a look at their performance. Okay, so Nina, what do you think? Give me your thoughts now, looking at these uh, financials. Okay. Oh. Yeah, they're not doing too good. Why do you say that? Because they've got losses. Exactly. Five, five right. years in a row. Yes, and um, it's actually more than that. Since since Twitter was created, they've never ever made a profit. Every year they've shown a loss. How much is the loss? Um, what's it? Five, five point, geez, five point two billion. No. No. Five hundred and twenty-one million. Yeah. Okay. okay. Half a billion. Yeah, half a billion exactly. As a net loss for the last completed financial year. Obviously, we're waiting for twenty sixteen to come out. Twenty sixteen just uh, finished uh, literally like a month ago. Okay, we're only in yeah. uh, February still. 
So obviously the 2016 year needs to be audited and confirmed before the financials are released. But if you look yeah. at Twitter's performance, Twitter is actually making a massive loss. A five hundred million dollar loss. Yeah. Negative. Yeah. So how is that possible? And they've never ever made a profit. They've always made a loss. Have a look. There's a nice small loss there. Well, I don't know, small is relative, but a hundred and twenty eight million dollar loss in twenty eleven. Then it got a bit better, only an eighty million dollar loss. All right, then something happened in twenty thirteen. That's a six hundred and forty five million dollar loss. Yeah. So now if this was your company, would you be happy with the set of financials that looked like this? Not really. Why not? You, you, no, when you say not you, really, uh, so, you so you wouldn't mind having a $521 million loss for the last completed financial statements? Uh, I don't think I'd be too happy. Okay. But why does Twitter still exist? Um, maybe their cash flow is keeping them alive. There we go. There's the answer. Okay, so... We can, we can now see that unprofitable companies can continue to operate because they manage their cash flow. Profitable yeah. companies can go bankrupt. Simple example, African Bank. Okay, if it yeah. wasn't for the Reserve Bank, if they didn't step in to save African Bank, they would have completely failed in this country and then we would have had all sorts of repercussions in terms of the market. So. Yeah. African Bank was profitable. They were showing profit after profit after profit, but they weren't managing the cash flow, which is what you said. So Twitter continues to operate because cash flow is being monitored and managed appropriately. Okay, which is the which is the separate statement. So do you agree if we just look at one statement, we're obviously going to say this is really bad. Yeah. And if we look at Facebook, we're going to be saying the opposite. This is really good. Yeah. Okay. But we need to look at things in context. And the last point that I want to write here is we need to consider value versus profit because that was the primary goal. Remember we spoke about the primary goal of a business? Is increasing shareholder wealth or value. Yeah. Okay, so it's not about profit. It's about the value you're creating because unprofitable companies can create a huge amount of value. Okay, mm. Twitter is still creating value. So how many people use Twitter? Any idea? Plains. It's a lot. How many people how, how many people use Facebook? More than Twitter. Definitely. Okay, so yeah. let's have a look at those numbers quickly. If we look at Facebook, or let, let's start with Twitter. Okay, Twitter, the number of users here, there we go, there's a thing. How many people use Twitter? Uh, it hasn't shown up. Uh, I think it says 320. That's right. 300. Okay, so oh. around 320 million active users worldwide. Is that value? I'd say so. That, that's it's quite value. a lot of people. Yeah, that's a lot. 300 million people around the world are using that platform. And if yeah. we look at the trend, that has increased. So their profitability is terrible, but are they still creating value? Yeah. Definitely. Okay, if we compare that to Facebook, let's have a look at Facebook in terms of their users. Okay. How many people use Facebook? Mm, a billion. Yes, okay. Yeah. One billion people in the world use Facebook. That's, that's like a fifth of the world's population. Yeah. Okay, using this particular tool. Okay, this platform. Right, so do you agree um, value is actually key? Yeah. Okay, value creates um, wealth. Okay, in terms of shareholder value, shareholder wealth. It's not about the profit. Okay, but look at Facebook. You can see Facebook is, is, is really succeeding in terms of Profit, user base and its profitability is yes. yeah. okay nice all right so coming back to the notes let's now focus our attention on this financial position okay so again facebook and twitter 
Okay, so if I'm looking at Facebook, how much assets do you think they have? Um, I don't. I don't think they have a lot of assets because they they're a tech company, so it's not like they're going to own properties and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so and, if you had to have a guess, oh, let's say half a billion in assets. Half a billion, so five hundred million. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, and then uh, Twitter. Mm, maybe a quarter of a billion, so 250 million. All right. Okay, so um, you, you're viewing these companies as being tech companies because tech companies are, I mean, it's literally just a website that people can um, post um, various things on, and that's the value proposition that they're offering. But in terms of assets, let's actually have a look at how much assets they hold. So yeah. if we go to Twitter, and we look at the assets on the statement of financial position. Let's have a look at how many assets they actually have. Okay, there's the balance sheet. Okay, if we just look at the one year, how much do they have? Uh, where are we? Okay. Wow, okay. <laughs> I was a bit wrong. How much is that? Uh, what's that? 60, 65 million? No. no 65 billion. Yeah, $6.4 billion. Jeez, okay. Okay, so Twitter actually has $6.4 billion worth of assets. Where though? What are those assets? Well, the assets, if we had to look at the detail, we're going to have to go down further. Um, Let's have a look. It's mainly things like brand, okay? Buildings as well. Um, and they do have things like, um, it's, it's intellectual property. Yeah. Okay, so it's those intangibles, All right? I'm, I'm just trying to see if I can find a more detailed breakdown of it. Okay, but that's how much they actually hold. Is that good or bad? Uh, that's pretty good. That's impressive, right? Yeah. Because think about what do assets do? They should create uh, income. They should create income exactly. Okay, I'll I, I can't find it now, but I'll, I'll I'll forward this to you if you if you're interested and you can maybe have a look yeah. at it in more detail. But that's that's fascinating to see that this is so much. This is so high, and yeah. if, even if you look at their liabilities, how much liabilities do they have? Two billion. Yeah, two billion. So they're net positive four point four. Yeah. So if this if this company had to had to sell today, all right, this company would be would would still have four point four billion US dollars after having paid off all their liabilities, but they're not yeah. making a cent in profit. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we can kind of see what they have here. There's their cash. So in terms of cash, just cash alone, that's nine hundred and eleven billion, not billion, million, million. dollars. It's almost a yeah. billion billion dollars in cash. Yeah. Okay. Property. They do have property, but you're right. They don't have as much. I mean, their cash is even more than their property, plant, and equipment. Yeah. Okay. I totally overlooked the, like you said, the intellectual property eh? and their their brand. Yeah. So that would be the working capital. That that's more um, things that can't be really that can't really be measured. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, you can see a a, a large amount of their assets are sitting in working capital yeah okay all right so that's twitter so is twitter still valuable yes definitely because if we just look at the balance sheet we can see that value. they've got 4.4 billion in value for shareholders yeah okay that's a lot okay all right let's compare that to facebook all right so let's go facebook. to facebook and let's, let's yes, get no. sorry what is that Facebook is probably going to be astronomical. Okay, well, let's have a look. How much is this? Assets, 49 billion. Yes. Okay, that's how much assets they hold. So in terms of assets, all right? Jeepers. And that's yeah, so much US for dollars. 500 billion. 
It's ten times what you expected it was going to be. Almost. A hundred times? No, uh, 500 million? It would be times ten. Ten times. Because you need, you need to... Oh, actually, you're right. A hundred times. It's a hundred yeah. times bigger than what you expected it, what you thought it was. Yeah. You're right. Impressive. Jeez. Are they doing a good job? Do you think that's impressive? I'd say so. I'd say so. Okay, so in terms of value, that's the amount of assets they have. Yeah. Okay, so if we're looking at the assets, also, in terms of property, plant, and equipment, there's their long-term assets, but also a large amount sitting in working capital. Have a look mm -hmm. at their cash and cash equivalents. Mm -hmm. 18 billion. Yeah, in cash and cash equivalents. In, in cash equivalents three times twitter their, yes. their total assets exactly yeah all right so that's how big these companies are because these are global companies we saw how many people use these these platforms right yeah okay so is value being created here yes okay but now do you agree both of these companies have assets but which company is making the most of their assets facebook correct okay because twitter's still running at a loss so in terms yeah. of operations, there's something wrong with that company. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, and then the next one is looking at this, the changes in equity, which is which is actually what we saw a bit earlier. Okay, we saw equity, the stockholders' equity, right, which is the net amount. Okay, obviously, um, if you look at the detail, they'll break it down a bit further. They'll show you how much interest and dividends and so on they pay out. We're just going to focus on that. So the net amount, the net amount that we saw earlier for... Um, Twitter was 4.4 billion and the net amount here for Facebook? 44. 44. So their liability is only five. So which yeah. company is more conservative? Um, Facebook. Well, oh, yes, in so. terms of the assets, the liabilities, correct? Yeah. Okay, so they only have a tenth. A tenth of their total assets are financed with liabilities. The rest of yeah. it is financed through equity. Okay. okay, so so Zuckerberg's doing a really good job in terms of managing the overall company because yeah. of what you see here. Their, their, their assets are healthy, their profitability is healthy, but we still need to consider one last thing, which is what? Cash flow. Exactly. And from our point of view, that's the most important because it's looking at the financial management, the FM. Yeah. Okay, so this is where the, the company either really succeeds or fails because we spoke about unprofitable companies continue to operate, but profitable companies going bankrupt because they don't manage their cash flow. So yeah. let's estimate cash flow for each of these again. What do you think for Facebook and what do you think for Twitter? Yes, uh, if the assets and all that are that big, Facebook, their cash flow must be in the billions as well. So let's say 15 billion. Okay, in terms of positive, okay, great. Positive yeah, or negative? Positive. 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 All right, and then Twitter? Um, if they're running at a loss, then their cash flow shouldn't be too good. So let's say minus a billion. Okay, so, so you're, 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 or you've got the view that Twitter has minus a billion in terms of cash flow. So they're not managing their cash flow, but Facebook is, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look. All right, so let's look at Facebook's then first. Okay, there's the cash flow. Year ended in millions. Uh, okay, it hasn't cleared up on my side yet. Okay, now it's just come through now. Uh, six billion. Yeah, all right, so pretty good in terms of a guess not not so far away that is the cash flow positive or negative big positive positive yeah. right so that's the amount of cash flow that they have net each year is this business going to run forever almost potentially uh, it could it could okay because their cash flow is positive they, they're profitable and they've got so much assets on their book yeah okay and then let's compare that to the to the other company. Okay, let's go back to Twitter and let's look at theirs. Uh, 
Uh, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Ooh, I went a bit too far. Right, if we go further up, we'll see it here. Um, that's the net loss. That's the balance sheet. Uh, where was it? Mm, I think it was a bit further down. Okay, I think let me search for it. Cash flow. All right, there's the cash flow. Uh, okay, this is the recon. Um, so the cash flow needs to be further up. Okay, still operations. Okay, so the, so Twitter hasn't actually disclosed it as well as Facebook. Okay, um, the yeah. financials aren't as easy to let's say find in terms of information. Um, they've actually looked at the recon here. Way. Pardon? Maybe they want it that way because it's not such a good cash flow. Uh, possibly. Let's see down here. Okay, we've got some information here. Uh, it's not it's not the same layout and format as the other one. Okay, but if we look at the net loss, okay, so this was net loss, which is accounting or, or cash flow? Mm, that's cash flow. That's isn't accounting, it? net loss, accounting. Oh. Okay, because we saw the same thing earlier. The, the, remember the 521 million loss? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, but this is focusing on liquidity. Okay, so in terms of operations, so are they operating at a net positive amount? yeah okay yes yeah. so the cash flow in terms of operations is positive yeah but if we look at investing and we look at financing their cash flow is negative yeah okay so overall their cash flow is negative if we just look at those three line items mm -hmm. yeah all right but if we look at operations they're still operating because it's still positive yeah okay so are they liquid? Well, they have some liquidity, okay, but their position isn't, it doesn't look as good as Facebook because Facebook is always net positive each and every year. Okay, so Twitter, yeah. uh, we would be worried about Twitter because if it wasn't for their positive operating activities in terms of cash flow, this company actually is doomed to fail. Yeah. Okay, based on what we have in the information. Right, so what are we trying to do with this exercise? What, what's the goal? To have a, to see, a, not a future for the companies, but to have an understanding of their way forward, if they're going to carry on or not. Yes, okay, it's to get an understanding or view on a specific company to make a decision. Okay, so we're looking at it broadly, okay, but if we wanted more information, we would then be able to find it by looking at the notes. Right, so we could look at the additional information. We could look at their policies. We could look at their calculations. We could even yeah. maybe look at certain transactions if they disclose a very large transactions. So, for example, Facebook bought, um, it was WhatsApp and Instagram not so long ago. That could yeah. be a extraordinary line item that they would have to disclose on their statements. Yeah. Right. So things like that are all part of the statement. So are the statements important? Yes. Very important because of decision making. They help us with identifying different areas that could be problematic or different areas that are uh, maybe doing well even. Yeah. Okay. Right. So in your textbook, they give you some examples there and they talk about a common sized financial statement where they use one line item as the base for all the other line items. So which is the most important line item on the statement? From which statements? Well, if we look at operations, how they're performing. Well, sales. The sales. Okay, so if yeah. we're looking at the statement of comprehensive income, we're going to be basing everything off the sale. Right, so if I keep it simple, let's say sales are 100. Okay, and then we've got maybe an admin expense. Okay, in terms of admin, you've got one over there. So what would the percentage B of sales that goes towards admin. 1%. 1%. All right, so mm. this would be a way as a common size statement because do you agree, if we look at Facebook and Twitter, the one company is a lot bigger than the other company, right? Yeah. So when looking at a common sized financial statement, we're going to be uh, lo looking at them in terms of like for like. 
So we're going to say, yes, Facebook is bigger, but if we use their sales as a base, how much goes to admin, how much goes to maybe employees, um, okay, or other expenses, okay? Maybe 10% for other expenses. And then if Twitter has uh, maybe 100, but they've got two for admin and 12 for other expenses. But if we look at common size statements, which company is performing better? The first um, or the second? Facebook. Yeah, the first would be performing better. Okay, I didn't yeah. use these figures from Facebook. I'm, I'm just yeah. I'm just making the reference. Okay, uh, but yeah, so we would we would take it as a percentage of. So sales would be a hundred, and yeah. then everything else would be a percentage of. Yeah. Okay. So looking at that, you would obviously say company one would be doing better, better than company two because a smaller percentage of their expenses are taken from the sales versus two more goes to admin and more goes to expenses. So we're yeah. not. We're not looking at each of these companies from a nominal point of view. We're looking at them as, as a ratio or a percentage. Yeah. Okay. And that's what we use in terms of common size statements. But fortunately, I haven't really seen any questions come up in the exam looking at common size statements. Okay, even theory-wise, they haven't really tested it. But they, they discuss it. Um, they test the ratios, which is what we actually need to look at. Okay. Right. So... Having spoke about a ratio in terms of a common, a common size statement, what ratio or why are ratios significant? I'm sure you could probably answer this now because we spoke about a common size statement. Any idea why no, a ratio would be more beneficial? It levels all the companies basically. So you can look at two completely different companies and have sort of like a, a common denominator to work with. Perfect, that's correct. Okay, it gives you a way to compare, 100%. It's, it's focused on this, the analysis. Okay, so what you just said was 100% correct. Okay, who uses it? We know there are internal and external users. Managers could use it, external individuals could use it, but it's used for decision making. There's yeah. two types of analysis. The one is cross-sectional, which is like, it's almost like a snapshot, so taking a picture. It's at one point in time, it's like a benchmark, okay? With a time series analysis, we're looking at scope. Okay, so we're looking at over time. Okay. And then we've got a combination of them both, which is a combined analysis. Okay, that's just theory. Uh, you're not gonna do a cross-sectional or a time series analysis as part of the exam or part of the assignments. Um, as I said, the focus is on these things, okay, the ratios. Yeah. We're looking now at the actual liquidity in terms of ratios, and we've got other groups of ratios as well, from debt to market to activity. There are different ratios that help us to calculate certain measures. So in 1601, okay, FAC 1601, they touched on ratios there as well, but it wasn't a focus in the exam purely because they're testing more the accounting rather than the analysis. In finance, they're testing the analysis rather than the accounting. So you don't yeah. need to worry too much about drawing any of the statements. All you've got to be worried about is, would you be able to identify the correct accounts for each of these different, let's say, um, amounts? Okay, so the first one is the current assets. So what forms part of our current assets? Uh, what do you mean, what forms part of the current What's would, would inventory fall under current assets? Oh, yeah, yeah. Inventory, your vehicles, your, your short-term your short -term assets, yeah. Exactly. Okay, short-term is the key when looking at current and the same thing at the bottom. Okay, so short-term yeah. assets, short-term liabilities. Right, so you said vehicles for current assets. Is vehicle a current asset? Uh, aren't those usually looked at as a current asset because they less than 12 months? Okay, vehicles normally last for maybe around three, four, five years, perhaps, depending. So vehicles yeah. uh, by default, okay, yeah. okay, yeah, vehicles by default would be long term not rather bad. than short term. Yeah, my okay. mistake. Um, if you're selling, if I'm going to be selling a vehicle, would that be short term? Mm, yes, the the price, the profits from that would be short term. That's well, the inventory because now it's inventory, not mm. not um, equipment. 
o obiectiv. Ok. Alright, so when looking at the current ratio, the current ratio gives us our assets to our liabilities. Do you want the ratio to be greater than or less than 1? Uh, greater than 1. Correct, because greater than 1 means that the current assets are exceeding the current liabilities. Yeah. And with the asset test, they also refer to this as the quick ratio. Okay, so now let's think about inventory. Can you always sell stock? Um, no. No, you can't. Okay, so when you look at the quick ratio, you're literally removing something that you might not be able to sell, and you're just looking at what's left. So what's left could be something yeah. like cash. Is cash easy to sell? Yeah. Well, you don't even need to sell it. It's already in its correct form that I can use to pay liabilities. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, so when looking at the current and quick yeah, ratio, yeah. we're focusing on assets and liabilities that are short-term in nature, and we're looking at the abilities, um, sorry, not the abilities, the company's <coughs> ability <coughs> to meet the short-term obligations. That's what you're looking at. Yeah. All right, so with the quick ratio, we also want it to be greater than 1. Even if I take out my inventory, yes. if I still have more assets to liabilities, that's a really good position to be in. So now let's define the word liquidity. What does that actually mean? Um, your so land, you. How? Oh, I don't know how to word it. Um, Converting things to cash, maybe? Like your ability to yeah. realize cash? Yes. Okay, yeah. so so what is more liquid? Okay, a vehicle or inventory? Mm, depends on the inventory, but I'd, I'd say a vehicle because you can literally go to a corner car dealer and sell your car. Okay, yes. Okay, so practically... Practically, it might be easier to sell the vehicle than it would be the inventory. But remember, vehicles would be a non-current asset and inventory would be a current asset. So oh, would yes, you put yeah. vehicles as part of the current ratio? No, you wouldn't. No, you yeah. would only put current assets. Okay, so be careful. We need to apply some of the accounting because sometimes yeah. you might be given accounts that you may or may not need to use. <laughs> okay. No, okay, I keep putting those vehicles in currents for yeah. some reason. Yeah. yeah, just be careful with that, okay? All right, so yeah. I'm just trying to give some examples just so you have an idea of how to approach it. So the first step is to do what? In Check an exam. We'll be looking at the assignment in a few weeks. So okay. what must we always do when it comes to ratio questions? Mm. What's step number identify, one? Identify what statements are you going to be looking at. Okay, okay, so the statement is where we get the information. But before we get the information, we need something. Oh, what, what ratio are you going to be using? 100%. Okay, so write down the equation so you've got it. Right, once you've got the equation, then we can look at finding the correct info. Okay. And then after we've got the info, number three is looking at which formula has the most information. Okay, i.e. only one unknown. Yeah. If we've got one unknown, can I find the missing amount? Yeah. Yes, I can. Okay, and that's what we're looking at here in terms of process. So when we apply this to your assignment questions, we'll approach it this way. Okay, we'll write down the formula. Okay, we'll find the correct information and then we'll substitute in. And then we'll look at, well, now, where do I have most of my information? Where I have most of my info is where I'm going to be starting. Okay. Okay. All right. So when looking at a ratio, these formulas you need to know off by heart going into the exam. Okay, obviously, for now, you don't have to worry about them. So what I would do is I would, I would maybe um, just tag this particular set of notes because we'll use this a lot when we actually do the the assignment and past papers because we need to practice using the formulas. That's yeah. important. Okay, and obviously with practice, hopefully 
they become easier to remember. These two aren't so difficult to remember because the word current ratio really tells you, well, it's current, so it must be short-term assets and liabilities. Yeah. Others are a bit more difficult to remember. Okay, so we'll try and look at ways and means to try and remember them as, as easy as possible. Okay. All right, okay. so here we've got inventory turnover. When you see the word turnover, what does that refer to? Um, moving your inventory. Like. Correct. All right, good. So what represents the actual movement of inventory? It's the cost of sales. Okay. Okay, so if I know what inventory turnover is representing, I just need to think about it. Well, if I know it's cost of sales, then that's going to be my numerator, and I'm going to divide that by, by my inventory, and that gives me a measure of how quickly or how slowly I'm, I'm selling my stock. Yeah. And that's activity. So these sets of ratios look at the activity, how quickly or slowly um, the company is operating. Okay. Okay, so to, just to relate this to your, uh, your business in terms of the, um, the manufacturing industry, Turnover ratios in the manufacturing industry, very high, very low? Uh, um, for us, it's very high because we work on uh, a tender basis. So we don't start the work until someone has actually placed an order with us. Okay. All right. So that's good. So you're almost using like a trust in time sort of sales system in a way where you're literally buying as and when you require it. That's smart. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not tying stock up. No, we, we keep very little stocks. Like some of the stuff that we do for the steel mills, like they, some of their specialized blades, we keep stock off. Yeah. But it's not, it's just because the setup times and all that, it pays us to actually make a few extra. It's not that we keep in stock for them. All right. Okay, great. Interesting. Okay, so, so with that then, in terms of um, that industry, uh, you mentioned um, you rely on the tenders for that. Uh, when you talk about tenders, are you, are you referring to government tenders or private tenders? Uh, no, no. Uh, the our biggest customer sends out RFQs. Okay. And then we'll quote, and then they place the order or don't place the order. And when they when they place that order is when we actually start the process of buying material and carrying okay. on. Okay. So it's it's not it's not a tender as what I'm thinking about in terms of like no, um, uh, trying no. to bid for a specific contract. No, 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 no. They they got rid of that a long time ago. They used to do that. Yeah. But there was a lot of bribery and corruption going on with that. So now Probably, they, yeah. thought that, you know, they thought that doing a, an RFQ basis was a better way to go. Okay, but is that central though? So, so anyone in the manufacturing industry would get those, those, those requests? Uh, it depends on the product that, they, that the steel mill wants. The specialized stuff, they have a, a preferred supplier list where there's a handful of companies. And then for the other run of the mill stuff, it gets sent out to a bit of a bigger, a bigger group of companies. Okay, so so in terms of uh, uh, is is there a lot of like uh, I don't, I don't want to say collusion because that's not the right word, but do do you know your competitors then? Yeah. Personally, or or not? Like in terms of because I, I'm 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 listening to what you're saying. It sounds like it's a very small industry where uh, there's. Uh, like there's like a supplier list of maybe I don't know a hundred. Not even. Not uh, even. I'd say with the specialized stuff that we do, there's about five or six companies that can do it. Sure, that's very little. So they're yeah. actually setting prices, then I guess. Probably. Um, not really because no, we know everyone. Yeah. that is on the list that we compete with them it's they they are competitors so essentially we are trying to give metal a better price than than they giving them but are prices regulated so who regulates the actual price or is it up to the actual businesses to <clears throat> to to price it it's up to the actual businesses okay that's interesting okay so so there isn't like a standardized um let's say pricing in terms of so for this item it costs x and all the suppliers um, cost according to that. No, okay. no, so it isn't because a lot of the, a lot of the company basis. Yeah, because a lot of the stuff that we do, it's uh, niche market type stuff. So although the material and the machining, like the, the equipment that you use, is the same, the processes that we apply and that sort of stuff is where 
we get ahead. Okay, all right. So it's the it's the actual processing of the raw material rather to get the finished product. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Okay, so so mm. Nina, do you have a background in engineering then? By 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 what I by what I'm hearing. No, I don't. I'm actually I've got a background in construction management. Okay, okay. Well, yeah. Because I, I would think maybe because um, it sounds very technical. It sounds some, It sounds like something an engineer would be doing. Yeah, my, well, my dad's a, a qualified engineer, and I went and studied construction management and yeah. worked there for about a year and said, I hate this, I can't do this. Yeah. And then I ended up working with my dad, and slowly I've built up a, a pretty good knowledge of the, the technical side of programming and running machines. Yeah, okay, fascinating, wow, okay, yeah. that's great. So, so in terms of that knowledge, that knowledge helps with, with decision making. So, so activity is yeah. all about the day-to-day -day running, right? Yes. And the first ratio we looked at here was the day-to-day -day running in terms of selling stock that we have on hand. Mm -hmm. And if we don't sell the stock, the stock is going to become obsolete. All right. Okay. So turnover ratio needs to be higher or lower? Lower. Why would you want it to be low? Because that means it's slower. Uh, oh no! Yeah, you want your turnover to, to be your turnover ratio to be higher so that it moves quicker. Yes, Sorry. that's right. Yeah. Okay, so the the actual amount, the number, the number that you get from the working, the calculation, you would want the number to be higher than let's say your competitor or higher than the industry yeah. in general. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Then, what does this look at? Average collection period. Uh, how long it takes for your debtors to pay you. Correct. See and. Try and make it easy to remember these equations. So just think about it logically. If we're looking at collection, who do we collect from? Debtors. So debtors, if we're collecting yeah. from debtors, debtors is part of the equation. And what's the relationship with your debtor? Well, they sell. Yeah. Okay, so you can use that. Um, the textbook does use different equations in terms of divide and a divide. A divide and a divide is a time. So you could actually write an equation that looked like this trade receivables over sales times 365 instead of divide by yeah. divide yeah okay so it doesn't matter how you represent the formula you can either use this a divide of a divide or you can convert it into multiply it's not going to make a difference to the overall answer but is the answer going to be in um a, a ratio or is the answer going to be in a unit uh, it's going to be in a unit isn't it yes number of days yeah Okay, and we would would we want this to be longer or shorter? Mm, shorter. Exactly. Yes, shorter for collections, longer for this one. Turnover ratio. Payments. Oh. Uh, well, higher, higher for turnover ratio. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I think there's a bit of a lag when you go onto your next page. I think you have it for a couple seconds before I do. Okay. All right. I'll wait a bit. And you got <laughs> okay. it. Yeah, I'm on page 15 now with you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so on page 15, we're focusing on the average payment period. So if the average payment period is focusing on creditors, then in the ratio, same thing applies. You'll have your trade payables over your purchases times 365. And do we yeah. want this to be longer or shorter? It depends on which side, like how you are i'd like it to be as short as possible but in theory you want it to be as long as possible yeah in in theory you would want to extend it as long as possible uh, without incurring costs and and fees and penalties and things like that yeah okay but in an ideal world as you said keeping it longer is slightly better because it's more cash flow in the business if you're paying your yeah. creditors before you actually need to that that's actually taking resources away from your business temporarily and moving yeah. it elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. And then we've got total asset turnover. This is an important one because you see this later in a separate formula called the DuPont equation. Okay, so I want to highlight okay. this and just write a note here, DuPont. Okay, it's part of DuPont as well. And we'll, we'll describe what DuPont does as the actual working the calculation. All right, so total asset turnover is look at how productive are you with your assets. That's what you're looking at. Okay, remember, it's not about how much you have, it's about what you do with what you've got. Yeah. So if I've got, let's say, one asset, but I'm generating two sales, my ratio would be two. 
two, yeah. Let's say another company has one asset, but they're generating three sales. Their ratio would be three. Which company mm. is better in terms of their total asset turnover? The, the one with three. Correct, the one with the higher ratio. Okay, so again, yeah. the higher the ratio in this example, the better it is for the company because you're generating more sales from the same amount of asset. If you're comparing one company to another, you're looking at how um, how productive are they with their assets? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. Then we've got a set of ratios here looking at debt. Is mm. debt important to monitor? Yes. Why? Well, if they, if a company goes into too much debt, then it's setting themselves up for uh, uh, quite a big fall. Correct. Okay. It adds risk. To the yeah. business okay so we, we we debated it earlier you you had a really good example um you you explained your view in terms of um your family business um raising capital rather in terms of equity rather than debt because it's more conservative but right? you don't yeah. want to have too much debt in the business because as you said if something bad happens and let's say the interest rates had to go up it's going to create a burden for the company yeah all right so with the debt ratio we're looking at how much liabilities we've got to our assets. Do we want this ratio to be higher or lower? Um, you want this one to be lower? Well, in this situation, you could actually say higher and lower. It depends on the type of business that you're running. Okay, so for okay. a conservative business, you would want a lower debt ratio. Yeah. For a more aggressive business, you would want a higher. But the best answer would be you would have to compare this to your competitors or you'd have to compare this to your industry. Okay. Okay, so in the industry, what is the average debt ratio? Okay, that is something that you, we, we would have to research. All right, and yeah. all of this you can find the information because as I said, if you're looking at your competitors, you could, you could almost, um, how can I say, replicate. You could almost replicate success if, let's say, um, we mentioned uh, we mentioned a bit earlier that your company is still small compared to some of the others that are listed on the exchange. So maybe yeah. at some point in time, you guys might even one day w choose to list on the exchange and you could maybe look at replicating what those current big companies are doing now because if you start with what they're doing now, over time, it could progress to that specific, uh, let's say, point where you'll actually list as an IPO. Mm. Okay, so industries are key because leverage is something that we need to measure, which is looking at your exposure. How okay. exposed are you to debt? How much liabilities do you have in the business? Right, because debt is good because it can maximize returns as well. Because think about yeah. it, you'd be able to use someone else's capital to grow your business. While still keeping your equity. While still keeping your equity, exactly. Okay, so it's mm. growing the business with external financing and also if you so for example if you had to finance things through equity I'm always going to have to give away a bit of ownership right yeah but now with debt do you owe the bank anything if you take out a loan well you mm. do for the duration yeah. of the loan but as soon as you've paid yeah. them back no you don't owe them a cent and all of those assets that you finance are yours yeah. Okay, so it, it doesn't dilute the ownership. That's another point to consider when looking at debt. Okay. Okay, debt doesn't dilute the ownership. Okay. All right. Then we've got times interest earned, the TIE ratio. When looking at TIE, tie you're looking at this, E-B-I-T. And you're looking at interest. And you're looking at the amount of times you're covering the interest. So okay. you, you do need to remember some of your accounts. EBIT is where on the income statement? Is it at the top or the bottom? Uh, at the top. Well, it's further up, it's, but yeah, it's closer it's, to the bottom because what must I still take off? Your taxes. And? And your, your interest. And your... So it's, it's interest first, and then you get EBT, mm -hmm. and then you minus the tax, and then you get earnings net profit yeah. earnings yeah net profit net earnings that's the profit for the year right so that is something that you need to remember i've seen a lot of questions that test you on this where they give you net profit and then they ask you to work backwards to get the ebit 
Yeah. Or they ask you the EBIT and then you need to work forwards to get the, uh, the net profit. So it all depends. Yeah. Okay, but that's something to, um, to keep in mind. Okay, so maybe something to add as well to the notes. Um, when looking at questions relating to EBIT, chances are you're going to have to draw that little sketch. Um, EBIT, interest, EBT, and then tax. Okay. Okay. All right, then we've got three margin ratios here. Margins are looking at profitability. Okay. The key word is margin. So what do we add to our cost of sales? A profit. So the profit margin is going to give us the sales. Right, so okay. all of those are going to have sales in the denominator. The only thing that changes is the numerator. Uh, do I either put gross profit, do I put operating profit, or do I put the net profit? Okay. okay. So these are quite easy to remember because profit will provide us with the idea in terms of sales. I'm selling something to make a profit. Yeah. You're going to have sales in the denominator. And then I just need to change the numerator. Yeah. Okay. These are okay. quite easy to do. They're not so they're not so tricky. Then we've got EPS, more profitability ratios. What's common with all of these? Numerator, denominator. Uh, numerator. Numerator. All right. So now, when looking at these ratios, EPS, ROE, ROA, they all have the same numerator. The only thing that's different is the denominator. And the denominator yep. is easy to remember because the actual question will give you the, the denominator. So when they ask you to calculate EPS or if they give you EPS, you know it's per share, so you must have shares in the denominator. Yeah. If it's return on assets, then again, it's on so assets, so it must have that as the denominator. And the same thing for equity. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right, then we've got market ratios. The last group of ratios here is looking at price to earnings, market to book, and book value per ordinary share. When looking at market ratios, they're looking at external. Okay, so something that's outside, external, T-E-R-N-A-L, external. Right, outside the business. All right, so when looking at market price, that's quoted in the market. So we're looking at the price that, some, that someone is willing to currently pay for that asset compared to the EPS. Okay, remember EPS is a separate calculation, hey? Yeah. And we might need it as well. So with longer questions, okay, when we get to the, um, the assignment questions, I'll, I'll show you um, the, the technique to approach, where you write down all the equations and you substitute everything in. It's basically the steps that I gave you a bit earlier when we wrote that down on um, yeah. over here, um, this, this over here. Okay, three separate steps focusing on application okay how should we go about approaching a ratio question because i've always seen students struggle with the ratios because there's so much that they give you in the question they give you like five maybe even six ratios in one question sometimes and and it's it's it's, it's actually more mathematics than than anything else yeah okay but we'll get there we'll we'll do lots of examples All right and then we've got the market to book same thing again market to book value so something external compared to something internal um, just be careful though with book value because book value has a separate calculation so if I highlight book value here book value is calculated by looking at that your equity okay. divided by your number of shares but right, it's a sub um, let's say formula to the main equation the main equation is looking at market to book but in order to calculate market to book you first need the book value. Okay. Okay. All right, and then just some cautions. Um, I haven't seen this come up in any of the exams yet. All right, this is just talking about some of the shortfalls to ratio analysis. So obviously ratios are looking at symptoms, not causes. So we might identify profitability as being an issue. Okay, something that we need to improve. But it doesn't pinpoint what is actually causing the decline in profitability. Mm. They also... <laughs> Are based in isolation okay, okay we're looking at separate things separately which creates a problem and also there could be seasonality right so what time of the year is the busiest for the manufacturing industry um, generally after the our biggest customer releases their budgets which is at what point in time during the year 
now in February. All right, so in Feb. So, so February, uh, February only or February, March, April? How many months well, does that extend for? It starts in February and it carries on for about, I'd say, about four or five months where they just place orders left, right, and center. Okay, good. Okay, so in the first four months then, or four or five months of the year, you would say, based on seasonality, that would be a, um, um, a busier time of the year compared to the rest of the year. Yes. Okay, and that can also throw the ratios out because if you're looking at ratios month by month by month, you need to provide for that seasonality because you're going to be thinking, well, we're making profit in the first five months and then things don't go as well in the last five. It's not because you're changing operations in any way. It's just because people don't have, the mu- don't have as much demand during the rest of the months. Yeah. And see, that's a shortfall. That's a caution. Right. Also, okay. audited versus unaudited statements. Which do we prefer? Audited. Definitely, because that's confirmation that those eight, those statements are more accurate. Yeah. Right. Then we've always got accounting. Accountants do things according to the accounting rules. And accounting rules don't always fit in line with the finance because finance is focusing on managing cash flow, managing yeah. finance. And there could be non-cash items that we don't consider. For example, do we consider depreciation in a cash flow? No. No, we don't. Okay, because depreciation isn't cash flow. It's not an inflow, it's not an outflow. It's just an accounting um, entry. Yep. Okay, and then external things could also affect the, the, the forecast. Things like inflation, things like um, news reports, maybe changes in the industry, legislation. Those are all things that could affect um, the actual analysis. Yeah. Okay, and then the last bit that I've put here is just some um, some additional notes here. We've got one about ratios, and then we've got one about DuPont. Okay, DuPont is the important one because it always comes up. We're breaking up one ratio into several different components. So always remember the accounting equation. And the reason why I've put that here is because if you know what the accounting equation is, you can use it sometimes, okay, to find missing figures. Sometimes information is incomplete. And by using the accounting equation, it helps us to identify one of the unknowns. So if they give you enough information about assets and liabilities, then owner's equity can be calculated. Or if they give you enough information about liabilities and owner's equity, then obviously assets can be calculated. So it's just a tool. It's just something to keep at the back of your mind because at some point um, you are going to be using the accounting equation, especially in the ratio questions. Okay. Right, and then I've given you a note over here about ratios must be analyzed collectively. And you'll see why here. If we compare these two companies, okay, this is an example from the textbook, okay, looking at no debt and debt. So this is a, um, a like, it's, how can I say, it's an it's a argument for companies to include more debt in their business. Because what does debt do to the company? We spoke about risk, okay? Does it increase yeah. or reduce risk? It increases risk. It increases risk. But if I increase risk, what should happen to reward? It should increase. It should increase. It may or may not. We need to look at the actual numbers. Okay, so if we look at the company with no debt, okay, so everything is equity. All right? And these companies are like for like. So they both have the same worth. They're just financed differently. So remember, financing is looking at that. The percentage of debt compared to equity. That's a financing decision. You decide how much debt and equity you're willing to take on as a business. Okay. Okay, so when looking at performance, are the companies performing any differently? No. No. Same sales, same expenses. The only thing that they don't have, which is in common, is their financing costs. Right, interest expense being one of them. Okay, so when okay. looking at no debt, what is the return on equity for a company without debt? 16.8. 16.8. Who gets that 16.8? Uh, the owners or the shareholders or whatever type of company it is. Correct. Okay, so the owners would be looking at a return of 16.8%. Good or bad? Okay. That's not bad. It's not bad. Okay. If we look at this with debt, what happens to the return on equity? 
it increases. It increases because now you're getting what? A benefit. And what is the benefit? The deductions and... Correct, the deduction. That's right. Okay, so what does debt offer the company? Mm. A tax saving. You end yeah. up paying less tax when you do have debt than when you don't have debt. And remember, companies pay tax on the first rand that they earn. Yeah. So for a company, having debt on their book can help reduce the tax that needs to be paid, which is going to do what to cash flow as well? Uh, it is going to increase it. It's going to help cash flow as well. Right, so by yeah. introducing debt, you're getting more... So here's the benefit. If you introduce more debt into the business, okay, you get an injection in terms of capital. Yes, you're going to have to pay interest, so you're going to have to pay a bit more there, but you pay less taxes, and as an owner in the business, you're increasing your return on equity because less of it is financed with equity and more of it is financed through debt. Yeah. Okay, so you, you need to be careful. That the, um, the point I'm trying to make with the slide is you cannot analyze things separately in terms of individual ratios. Ratios need to be combined because if I look at this, I would be saying yes to this. But what have I done to the risk in the business? Yeah, you've increased it. I've increased the risk. And that's the problem that we may have to deal with. Okay, so are we happy to increase risk? If, if we are, then doing this is perfectly acceptable. If we're not, then we need to think about maybe other alternatives. But it's just yeah. one ratio. It's return on equity. And the reason why we've got this example is because DuPont breaks up return on equity into those three separate sections okay and the one that's important is this one financial leverage because that was what we spoke about here on this slide okay what did leverage do to the company it increased owner's equity uh, right yeah the return yeah. on owner's equity yeah okay so when looking at the dupont system of analysis dupont breaks up roe into three separate components the net profit margin the total asset turnover and the financial leverage multiplier. Total asset turnover you've seen before. Okay, there's the ratio for total asset turnover. Yeah. Sales of assets. Yes, and here's the ratio for net profit margin. So what I've done okay. in your slides is I've put a block around those two because if I take the net profit margin and I multiply it by the total asset turnover, can I cross cancel the sales? Yeah. Yes, I can. And then what am I left with? I'm left with profit for the year minus pref share div over total assets. And what is that actually? It's this. It's return on assets. Exactly. Because we saw that earlier. If we go back to this slide, okay, there's return on assets. Okay, so again, let's add something here, DuPont. Because return on assets is also part of the DuPont model. Okay, so that's something to bear in mind because when we approach questions, when we're, looking at, when we're looking at the assignment, when we're looking at the exams, we need to spot places where I could use DuPont. So when I see ROE, when I see TAT, total asset turnover, okay, I know the chances of using DuPont are a lot greater than if I yeah. didn't have those um, ratios in the question. Okay. Okay, so just something to bear in mind when approaching questions. Okay. Right, and then the last bit over here is just the financial leverage. So what is financial leverage? It is your total assets over your ordinary shareholder's equity. And you'll notice if I cross cancel all of this, so sales with sales, assets with assets, you're actually going to land up with that ROE. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's just expanding the ratio to get a better view on what is your actual return attributable to. Okay, is the return on equity attributable to profit margin? So, so here's, here's, the, uh, here's the theory related to the formula. Okay, so remember, who owns the company? The owners or the, the shareholders. Correct. Or... And what do they want? Profit. Exactly, return on equity. So to get return on equity, 
What are they going to be focusing on? Well, two things. Should we charge more for our items in terms of sales? Okay, that's what you're yeah. looking at with net profit margin. How productive are you with your, uh, with your markup uh, in terms of uh, um, marking those items up? Do you have a very big margin or very thin margins? Okay, your total yeah. asset turnover is looking at how productive are you with your assets that you have, so your capacity. Okay, so are you doing as much as you can with what you've got? And then mm -hmm. the last bit is the leverage, looking at the level of risk. How much risk yeah. are you taking? Are you going to be using more debt or are you going to be using more equity? And all yeah. three components contribute to the return that you actually get as the investor or as the owner of the business. Okay. Okay. Is that all right, Nino? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And that covers all the content for this week in terms of the ratios. Okay. okay, there are a few short questions in the study guide. Um, remember, we're going to be focusing on assignments and past papers. That's our focus because that's the best way to practice in terms of getting questions that are at the right standard. Perfect.